So I welcome each of you um, today to the talk by Professor Ken Kawashima. And I'm Hyeonho Park, Professor of Sociology, as many of you know, and also Director of Korean Studies, Korean Office for Research and Education, Korea, at Yogi University. So I'm going to begin with the land acknowledgement. Um, so your university recognized that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which your university campuses are located that precede the establishment of your university. Your university acknowledges the presence of the tra tra traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabe Nation and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the huron wendat it is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of a dish with a one spring, one pound belt covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. So I'd like to thank the Academy of Korean Studies for supporting Korean Studies at York University. With this generous five-year funding, we established the Korean Studies Institute, Kore, and the Kore for the last five years has spearheaded the development of research and education activities at York, and then also engaged in collaboration across many universities, four universities in Eastern Canada, and then also three universities in the US, including University of Toronto and Waterloo University and so on. And I thank the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of Toronto, Ken's Home Department, for co-sponsoring this talk and an offering very generous support. And I also thank Corey Steph, the coordinator, Minyoung Kye, and Susan Lee, the graduate student assistant. They took care of complex logistics of doing this in-person event. Even the refreshments were chosen carefully within the COVID restrictions. So no hot tea, no coffee, but you know, individually wrapped in cookies and chocolate. So please feel free to indulge yourselves. So I'm very delighted and privileged to introduce Professor Ken Kawashima, our friend, colleague, and comrade as a today's speaker. Ken is Associate Professor at the University of Toronto, again, Department of East Asian Studies. In the music world, he's known as Sugar Brown, as he composes, sings, and records blues music under his name. <coughs> Professor Kawashima researches and teaches the Marxist political economy theory, the histories of capitalism in Japan and colonial Korea, the critique of ideology, everyday life and racism, and theories of the subject. He's the author of the very important book, The Proletarian Gamble, Korean Workers in Interwar Japan, that was published by the Duke University Press in 2009. He also co-edited Tosaka Jun, a critical reader, published in 2014. And he has also published many important articles, including Kafter's Dice Box Shaking, published in Rethinking Marxism and The Hidden Area Between Marx and Foucault, published in Positions is Asia Critique, Culture Critique. Soon to be released this year are two articles that he has been working, Bringing Marx Capital with the, the late Foucault and W.E.B. Du Bois, Black Const Reconstruction. So tune in for the soon to be released. So today, Ken will be speaking for 45 to 50 minutes, and the Q&A discussion follows it. He will draw on the, his translation of Runa Koja's theory of crisis that was published last year by Braille, and again this year by Haymarket Publishers. I met him for the first time more than two decades ago in 1998. I believe he was still talk, at the time talking about Uno, even <laughs> then. So since then, um, of course, his interest in UNO theory only has deepened. So I have come to know Ken through UNO and UNO through Kawashima, the inseparable duo. So the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Yeah, Hyonok uh, was actually on my dissertation committee back at New York University Department of History long ago. Uh, but thank you for inviting me to speak at York, and uh, uh, thanks for the Department of East Asian Studies for supporting this. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Uno's Theory of Crisis, originally published in 1953 in Japan and in Japanese. Uh, I finally translated it into English. Um, and it's a book about political economic theory, a theory of crisis based on Marx's capital. Um, and uh, I decided for this talk uh, to not only speak about the book on its own terms as a political economic theory, of crisis, but even though I'm going to try to uh, hammer away at its fundamental theoretical argument, but mostly I want to talk about how this book, the first part of my talk is really how this book helped me write a, a historical analysis of, of Korean worker struggles in interwar Japan. Um, it's an example of what Lenin called a concrete analysis, or I thought it would be an, an example of a concrete analysis of a concrete situation. And then in the second part, I'd like to talk about the theory of crisis, really, in, in its core, and conclude with some thoughts on politics. But uh, to begin with, I wanted to just introduce Uno Kozo, his general methodology for political economy. Uh, oh yeah, so these are the two books. So his theory of crisis helped me write this other book, basically. But the, I want to just quickly go over his basic, uh, he has a whole method for political economy. And it has three levels of analysis that go from the most abstract to the concrete. And in that sense, he was, had great fidelity to Marx. The first is the theory of the fundamental principles of political economy based on Marx's capital. And Uno's theory of crisis is also part of this level. Then he has a theory of the historical stages of capitalist development, which is really Im inspired by Lenin's analysis of imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, and he, Uno wants to teach us that we need to have these first two levels in our minds before we carry out uh, the analysis of the present conjuncture, what he calls the genjo bunseki, uh, which I would also call a concrete analysis, the concrete situation. And so I want to begin, uh, his method goes from the abstract to the concrete. Uh, my talk will actually do the opposite because I want to extract really some of the theoretical points. I'll begin with the historical and concrete and conclude actually with some theoretical problems. So I begin with history. Um, Uno's uh, method of analyzing the historical stages of capitalism has three stages. We can see these here. They're based on the history of state economic policies and capitalist crisis. First stage mercantilism, basically when capitalism is like a little baby, then it grows in the stage of liberalism, laissez-faire free trade, and declines in the stage of imperialism. And these are the dates, the significant countries, significant forms of capital, significant capitalist crises. And as a historian of modern Japan, his, this theory of the stages, this very teleological approach to the stages helped me also frame my own analysis of the history of capitalism in Japan, which would look a little bit like this. Its own stage of mercantilism beginning with the Meiji Restoration of 1868, a very brief period of liberalism and laissez-faire, and this very long, uh, endless, seemingly endless stage of imperialism. That really was the frame for my analysis. And the other thing about Uno's method, and specifically about the theory of crisis, if I can just say a one theoretical point, is that when he analyzes the problem of, or the phenomenon of crisis, he's analyzing it in terms of what he calls a logic of capital based on Marx's capital. But he's really analyzing phases of capitalist accumulation, which is based, he says, on the commodification of labor power, which will be this mantra I'll be repeating over and over today. But basically, there are these three phases of accumulation, which forms a kind of vicious cycle, uh, where we see the phase of crisis is in the middle, uh, but it leads inevitably to a phase of depression. So in my uh, historical analysis, I looked at, first of all, Korean proletarian struggles in Japan in the accumulation phase of prosperity in the capitalist stage of imperialism between these years very specific struggles, mostly in the extractive industries. I'm going to go very quickly through this historical stuff. 
Then there's another stage of prosperity of, uh, about 25, 30 years later, where we see another phase of prosperity between 1938 and 1945 during World War II, which ended with the bombs, but it's also a time of the Japanese empires, the fascist uh, uh, empires, greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. So between these two phases of prosperity, there is this long trough, this long valley of struggles of Korean workers in, in a phase of crisis and in a phase of depression. And the struggles look a little bit like this. There was a huge proliferation of Korean struggles during the crisis and phases of depression. Uh, and I won't go through all of them. I just wanted to give you just an image of uh, how vast they were during this period of crisis and depression. Especially, uh, I would point out, uh, this is really what my book was really about, the construction worker struggles in the construction industry, <clears throat> what they fought against, uh, problems of non-payment of wages, and what they called intermediary exploitation. We see them politically organizing around 1925 to 1929 with different factional splittings of federations, of communist labor unions. And then we see after 29, uh, kind of uh, splintering of, the, of Korean proletarian struggles from struggles at the point of production, as it were, into more tenant struggles around housing, uh, and then against police brutality and anti-fascist struggles and struggles in the unemployment agencies. So this kind of gives you just the broad uh, historical uh, framework for my analysis. And uh, it was guided by Uno's theory of crisis, but also his theory of the stages of capitalist development. And I, uh, I just would like to read a few things now about this book. Uh, the Proletarian Gamble is a book about the political struggles of Korean workers amidst economic crisis and depression in the capitalist stage of imperialism. I argued that these struggles had one deeply uh, uh, grounded, one uh, common ground, uh, which kind of united many of these struggles. Uh, and this was grounded in what I called, following Uno's work, the commodification of labor power. <coughs> but generally speaking, what uh, inspired me as a, hit, as a historian was to witness how, in the immediate crisis of their own everyday lives, they acted so decisively, so actively, to identify as quickly and as best as they could the most immediate and direct causes of their experiences of injury, misery, poverty, violence, oppression, and then to negate and overcome them in practice. Sometimes their actions succeeded, but many times they did not. And this led to the emergence of a plurality of interpretations and identifications of sources of injury but uh, arguably, because of this plurality of interpretations, it also became possible for many workers to misrecognize or confuse fundamental or deep causes of their suffering with more direct and immediate causes. For example, many Korean workers that I studied came to uh, believe that the cheap wages that were paid to them by Japanese capitalists, uh, that is, when they were paid, they believed that it was caused by the fact that they were discriminated against by Japanese simply for being Korean. But if we think about it, uh, being Korean itself is ultimately the, the uh, result of the accidental occurrence of the birth of these workers in a country called Korea. Yet being Korean commonly came to be interpreted as the basic cause of their oppression as well as of their cheap wages. And I would say that we could say that uh, the purely accidental character of being Korean was somehow turned, perhaps ideologically, into a necessary and inevitable cause of their oppression. And often, being Korean was even considered to be the only cause of their oppression, as if they believed that they could be liberated from oppression if only they were not discriminated against for being Korean. Now, is this an accident? Uh, 
This, I think, uh, points to many uh, difficult problems of the colonial question, of the national question. I think it also points us to uh, consider the ideology of liberalism and its many expressions of pluralism. And I also believe it's an example of what uh, Professor Assad Haider of York University has so helpfully called a mistaken identity which has a politically neutralizing effect upon mass movements, especially as a racial ideology. And in the case of the Japanese, uh, in the case of, of Japan, and specifically with the Japanese Greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere, which emerged out of the interwar period of economic depression, this is a good example of this kind of racial and national ideology. The Greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere, we could say, was a fascist and imperialist machine that, as it were, mass-produced mistaken identities and liberal colonial subjects. The problem that, uh, uh, one of the greatest problems is that the Korean workers I studied in Japan often did not recognize that their belief in being Korean as the perceived cause of their oppression unwittingly played into the racial multi-ethnic and national ideology of the Japanese state and empire, which was so full of contradictions. For example, while it promoted the assimilation of Koreans into Japanese society, Korean workers were never imagined or allowed to be anything else but Korean. Many Korean workers failed to recognize that by believing that being Korean itself was the cause of their oppression, they had I would say tragically and unbeknownst to them, played into the strategies and policies of the metropolitan and colonial state apparatus, which strove so indefatigably after 1917 to divide and conquer the working class overall as a class by institutional techniques and practices, which forced upon the impoverished masses, ethno-national and racial identities one by one precisely as a politically neutralizing technique of preventing workers from identifying with being a worker and a member of a proletarian class. And this uh, quote-unquote mistaken identity also fell prey to diverse strategies of biopolitical institutions, such as those of the police and welfare organizations, which liberally created techniques of inter-worker competition during the chronic economic depression. And these institutions individuated populations of workers by bureaucratic and administrative means and according to diverse categories of power knowledge as well as by means of brute police violence on the streets. So uh, some fundamental historical questions that I think I can now better articulate after all these years is one, how were the historical realities of the Korean workers concrete situation and the realities of their political practices? How were they linked or not linked in struggle and within the crisis of their own everyday lives? How was the historical reality of capitalist crisis and depression and the reality of their struggles articulated or not articulated? Finally, how can we account not only for what these workers were struggling against and what they were articulating in discourse, but also for what they were not always able to perceive or represent as objective problems of their historical reality. And I think here we, 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 we simply need theory. Uh, we simply cannot uh, just repeat uh, the empirical histories of the Korean struggles. If we want to de develop, I think, the political implications of the concrete historical struggles of these Korean workers, who were uh, not only struggling against forms of domination, but also struggling to even make sense of their chaotic situation, it's not enough to speak on their behalf and in, in terms of his, historical and empirical terms. I think it's also necessary to speak in theoretical terms and on behalf of what the workers themselves were unable, for whatever reason, to perceive or represent as objective problems. I don't think this is uh, to ignore, uh, deny, or disavow their historical thinking, or their analysis of their present, or their voices of political dissent. I think it's rather to give the theoretical reason 
for the reality, concreteness, and essence of their practical struggles. So I, I want to just assert that the point of theory is not to detract attention away from their thinking of the concrete singularity of their struggles, but to give added theoretical reason to ground their active intuition, their courage, and political practice, as well as to overcome many mistaken identities. And now I'd like to then turn to some theory. We can ask, what is the use value of Uno Kozo's theory of crisis? For me, and I think he would agree, the use value of this book is that it gives us a theoretical exposition of the necessity or inevitability, as well as the periodicity of the phenomenon of capitalist crisis, parentheses from a certain perspective of, we could call it the ontology of capital. And I would also say that as a translation question, the translation of Hitsuzensei, um, I translated as necessity, but uh, Ito Makoto insisted um, and basically forced me <laughs> to <laughs> translate it as inevitability, which has a different, I would say, rhetorical effect. Um, but in this talk, I will kind of alternate between these two terms. But to, to think of the inevitability or necessity of crisis, as well as the periodicity, um, theory of crisis generally teaches us that we are deluding ourselves to think that the phenomenon of crisis is accidental to capitalism or that it is simply possible under capitalism. More uh, inconsolably, it teaches us that crisis is necessarily periodic and arguably inevitable under the capitalist mode of production. Moreover, and this is really, I think, the key thing of his theory of crisis, the phenomenon of capitalist crisis is caused fundamentally by the same historical materialist process that also establishes the capitalist mode of production itself. And this is what he calls the commodification of labor power, which is also his way of encapsulating what Marx called in chapter six of Capital, the sale and purchase of labor power as a commodity. And as, as we all know, for Marx, this specific exchange represents the defining encounter that gives birth to the capitalist epoch and the capitalist mode of production. But for Uno, this phrase, the commodification of labor power, not only represents the perspective from which he theoretically reconstructs the origins of the capitalist mode of production, it, is also, it also represents the perspective from which he proposes to initiate the revolutionary transition from capitalist society to communist society. As he wrote in his book from 1958, Capital and Socialism, the planned economy and socialist movements should begin precisely on the basis of the abolition and overcoming of the process of the commodification of labor power. Now, many Marxists uh, are, of course, very keen to know how Uno's theory of crisis compares with and differs from uh, other Marxist theories of crisis. Since I'm at York University, I must say something about this. Uh, theory of crisis has a distinctly different uh, uh, perspective, first of all, on Marx's capital, uh, as well as from uh, other Marxist theories of crisis. For example, theories of the phenomenon of the tendency of the profit rate to fall, or theories of the phenomenon of overproduction and underconsumption. For Uno, basically these phenomenon, falling rates of profit, uh, overproduction, underconsumption, for him, these are derivative phenomenon of a more fundamental or ontological cause of crisis that for him is endemic to the form of capital itself and more fund specifically to the commodification of labor power. So that's his whole angle. Um, Moreover, theory of crisis, unlike other Marxist theories of crisis, emphasizes and defines the phenomenon of capitalist crisis in terms of the contradiction between excess capital on the one hand and surplus populations on the other. So in doing so, he clarifies not only how, under a capitalist mode of production, poverty and chronic unemployment and precarity necessarily coexist alongside excess excessive affluence, 
It also clarifies theoretically how and why the ruling capitalist classes are periodically, inevitably, and completely incapable of managing its own products of labor as capital. It demonstrates how the so-called market rationality under capitalism can only operate normally through its own irrationality, inoperability, and brokenness, most clearly visible in the contradictory, unresolvable, and schizophrenic phenomenon of excess capital on one side and impoverished surplus populations on the other. So we can now ask, uh, why does Uno Kozo bother to demonstrate the necessity or the inevitability of crisis theoretically? And here, I think it may be helpful to distinguish Uno's approach from Lenin's approach of, to crisis, uh, not in order to negate uh, Lenin's analysis, but to, to help ground it theoretically and make it stronger. For example, in 1897, in a characterization of economic romanticism, Lenin famously defined capitalist crisis as, quote, the contradiction between the social character of production and the private uh, character of appropriation. Uno does not deny this contradiction or the existence of it, but he stresses that it can only explain, he argues the possibility of crisis and not its combined inevitability and periodicity. He writes, a true elucidation of crisis will not be possible unless we understand this contradiction in terms of the fundamental contradiction of capitalist society that derives from the commodification of labor power. The contradiction of social production and private appropriation is common in the capitalist commodity economy, and while it can be said that it reinforces the possibility of crisis, it is not the ground of the inevitability of crisis. In Uno's thinking, the fundamental ground of the inevitability of capitalist crisis is identified as the commodification of labor power. He writes, the phenomenon of crisis, which represents the fundamental contradictions of capitalist society while simultaneously resolving them practically, is grounded precisely in the commodification of labor power. Now, we can then ask why is the commodification of labor power necessarily a contradiction itself? Because for Uno, it's due to this contradiction surrounding labor power as a commodity that all the other capitalist uh, contradictions in the economic base become inevitable and periodic, such as, as I mentioned, the falling rates of profit or uh, uh, falling rates of profit colliding with rising interest rates, which is a collision that can just paralyze the entire reproduction process of capitalist accumulation. How does labor power as a commodity represent capital's fundamental contradiction? This contradiction can be stated axiomatically in my words in the following kind of what I call a double bind for capital. In order for capital to produce surplus value, capital and capitalist must consume as a commodity that which capital cannot produce as a commodity directly, namely our, our labor power. So capitalism must consume labor power as a commodity to produce surplus value and profit, but the double bind is that it cannot produce this commodity which is not originally a commodity, it cannot produce labor power directly. For UNO, this uh, represents capitalism's weak point, or its Achilles heel. He writes, the commodification of labor power forms the fundamental basis of capitalist society, but since labor power is not originally produced as a commodity by capital, yet is transformed into one, labor power in this sense is the fundamental weak point of capitalist society. So this contradiction uh, shows, I would say also, uh, how the logic of capital based on Marx's capital, which is based on the commodity form, we could say it's not a closed system. Uh, rather, it's a logic that has a space of difference or a kind of agonistic and undecidable space built into it precisely around our labor power as a commodity whose supply can never be managed or moved like other commodities that capital can produce directly and so excessively. And I think it's important to emphasize this gap in the commodity logic, which shows that it's not a closed system. And here, I totally disagree with Tom Sekinay, uh, 
in his reading of Uno, uh, we need to emphasize this gap in the logic of the capitalist mode of production because it sets the stage for one of Uno's most important yet uh, kind of uh, underappreciated or understudied theoretical points. Uno argues that because of this weak point around our labor power as a commodity, capital cannot avoid having to pass through this gap or this lack in which the commodity logic is necessarily broken or inter interrupted. Capital can only pass through this gap by means of violence or force or what Uno called a peculiar absence of reason. And here is where Uno famously uh, introduced this term where he says that the commodification of labor power discloses the work of what he calls the moody, which we translate as a kind of absence of reason. This is what it looks like in Japanese. And the moody, this is the character for nothingness and this is the character for reason. So combined, it means something like impossibility or refusal, but also force. For example, colloquially speaking, you say, hey, can you lend me uh, $50,000? And they say, moody, <laughs> impossible. Or you say, you're trying to fix a uh, machine and you, you kind of like start hammering at it. They say, take it easy, don't moody, you know, moody shinaide, you know. Um, but it also means a kind of impossibility. But literally, it means a kind of absence of reason. Precisely because capital cannot produce labor power as a commodity directly, even though it must consume it as a commodity in order to produce surplus value, capital is constantly passing through, he says, this moody, in which force alone prevails. Uh, perhaps we could say Uno's concept of moody represents some reality of class struggle which cannot simply be easily represented. But Uno is also saying that if this moody is traversed, if it is uh, successfully traversed, which as we know happens every day, the outcome will be nothing short of inevitable and periodic crisis defined as a phenomenal contradiction between excess capital and surplus populations. So for this reason, Uno calls upon us to demand the abolition, the negation, the refusal, the overcoming, of this absence of reason that is endemic to this process of the commodification of labor power. And he says then, which is the Japanese translation for Alfheven and Alfheboom, a kind of abolition and overcoming. I also want to say that when we think about this problem of the commodification of labor power, we could say, or I would like to say, that it represents a world historical pivot of struggle that grounds the capitalist mode of production and its processes of accumulation and reproduction. And how is it a pivot? On the one hand, it marks the terminal point of the process of expropriation and dispossession, the end point of the disintegration of pre-capitalist agrarian communities, and the apogee of the historical development of the commodity form in a given society. The commodification of labor power completes the despotism of the commodity form and concludes the process that began with the commodification of land and the expropriation, theft, and dispossession of land from so-called pre-capitalist communities. But on the other hand, the commodification of labor power marks the beginning point of properly, specifically capitalist exploitation and accumulation. So for me, the commodification of labor power represents a pivot between expropriation and exploitation. And we could further say that uh, because of this, we could say the commodification of labor power is a process that is a pivot between capitalism's sphere of circulation and its sphere of production. It is therefore the epicenter of capitalist reproduction. And from the perspective of subject formation, we could say it's a massive pivot around which the subject experiences great torsion. So uh, I think the most important lesson for me of the theory of crisis is that not only is the commodification of labor power the secret, as it were, of 
inevitable and periodic capitalist crisis. It also represents a crucial yet understudied historical and materialist vector of power, knowledge, subjection, and domination, but also of potential subjectivation, emancipation, and revolutionary consciousness. We do not study the commodification of labor power in order to simply explain or demonstrate the inevitability and periodicity of the phenomenon of capitalist crisis theoretically. Rather, the analysis of the inevitability of crisis should lead us back to the historical and political problems of the radically violent contingencies that are structurally as well as historically endemic to the specific position of selling labor power as a commodity. And this contingency of this exchange can, I think, also be expressed as what Louis Althusser late in his life called the aleatory encounter between owners of labor power and owners of money. And I, with this thought, I'd like to uh, have uh, speak a few words about uh, Marx and the late Althusser, which I think resonate with Uno's project around questions of politics and practice and philosophy. And so I'd like to turn to this problem, and I'll talk about politics, but also philosophy and even a little bit of poetry, what I'm calling poetry. And this will be my final section. I think for me as a historian, one of the uh, most exciting but one of the hardest uh, challenges of writing a history of the present under the domination of the capitalist mode of production is that it has to account for this encounter, uh, for the historical encounter and struggles between owners of labor power on one side and owners of money capital on the other. As Marx wrote in Capital, in order to extract value out of the consumption of a commodity, our friend the money owner must be lucky enough to find within the sphere of circulation on the market a commodity whose use value possesses the peculiar property of being a source of value, whose actual consumption is therefore itself an objectification of labor, hence a creation of value. The possessor of money does find such a special commodity on the market, a capacity for labor, in other words, labor power. Here, Marx describes how the capitalist must be lucky enough to encounter the owner of labor power on the market. But of course, Marx would then show how it was, in fact, not an accident at all that the owner of labor power found themselves on the market with nothing but their labor power to sell as a commodity, because it was the inevitable result of the expropriation of direct producers from the land and inevitable effect of so-called primitive accumulation. But uh, from the perspective of the capitalists, uh, this, this encounter is a lucky and fortunate one, arguably because it relieves the capitalist from experiencing what we could perhaps call capital's uh, ontological angst, which is caused by capital's inability to produce labor power as a commodity directly, even though it must consume this thing as a commodity. And I would add that capital can is capital is forced, as it were, to uh, compensate for this problem by producing a relative surplus population as an indirect, I call it a prosthesis, of the originally absent labor power commodity, typically in the accumulation phase of crisis and depression. So what Marx called the law of populations that's peculiar to the capitalist mode of production, it reveals the work of producing basically unemployed workers, and the result is that the originally accidental encounter between owners of labor power and money now appears as if it is inevitable. But on the other hand, uh, when we think of this encounter, we've looked at it from the capitalist side, how is it experienced by the owners of labor power? In the Grundrisse, Marx wrote this. He said, it is already contained in the concept of the free worker that he is a pauper, virtual pauper. According to his economic conditions, he is merely a living labor capacity necessity on all sides without the objectivities necessary to realize himself as labor capacity. He can live as a worker only insofar as he exchanges his labor capacity for that part of capital which forms the labor fund. And this exchange is tied to conditions which are accidental for him 
and indifferent to his organic presence, he is thus a virtual pauper. And um, I learned this trick from my friend Kanishka to uh, really accentuate some of these phrases, and I've created a poem out of this little phrase. I will call it a communist poem, Après Marx, number 270. A pauper, virtual pauper, economic conditions, a living labor capacity, necessity on all sides, exchanges labor capacity for capital. This exchange, conditions, accidental, he is thus a virtual pauper. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> in sum, for the owners of money capital, the encounter is, but also is not, strictly accidental. However, for the owners of labor power, for us, the encounter is necessarily accidental, necessarily prone to all kinds of hazards and contingencies. And for this reason, the so-called free worker is structurally already a virtual pauper. And uh, if we were to go deeper into this, the inevitable precarity of this position we could say stems from what Marx called the salto mortale of selling commodities, including labor power, with the hopes of realizing their value in the universal equivalent of all commodities, namely in money. So uh, for me, um, what is at stake, I think, uh, in reconsidering this encounter as a historical conjuncture is for me, uh, it's a way to redefine and re-clarify the proletariat. Uh, what I would like to emphasize is a conception of the proletariat as, uh, as, as an existence of someone who has been stripped of everything except for labor power to sell as a commodity, who has been expropriated, but theoretically speaking, who has not yet inevitably or necessarily been exploited within capitalist production. So this is a conception of the proletariat that attends to what I myself called uh, the proletarian gamble, which is really a problem of the conjuncture of this encounter, as well as, what, as, well as of what <coughs> Marx called the virtual pauper. And it's in this uh, regard that uh, I believe, or uh, I think that Uno's theorization of the commodification of labor power and Louis Althusser's late writings on what he called the materialism of the encounter, I think they intersect and collide with each other rather interestingly. Uh, and both Uno and Althusser share, it seems to me, a certain common drive to rethink or redefine proletarian existence away from the conception of the proletariat as merely the result or effect of capitalist exploitation. It is rather a conception of the proletariat that embodies the precondition of capitalist exploitation, but who is not yet necessarily exploited. So as many of you may know, uh, in, in Althusser's late text, Underground Current of the Materialism of the Encounter, Louis Althusser pointed out that Marx and Engels recognized both conceptions of the proletariat, but they increasingly identified and normalized the conception of the proletariat as the inevitable result of capitalist exploitation, as the result of the many laws of motion of the capitalist mode of production. Marx and Engels tended to promote the latter definition of the proletariat, even if they also insisted on identifying proletarian existence in relation to the uncertainty and the contingency of the exchange process. As Althusser writes, Marx deliber deliberately leaves the aleatory nature of the encounter and its taking hold to one side in order to think solely in terms of the accomplished fact of the take and consequently its predestination. This explains why Marx and Engels conceive of the proletariat as a product of big industry, a product of capitalist exploitation, confusing the production of the proletariat with its capitalist reproduction on an extended scale as if the capitalist mode of production pre-existed one of its essential elements, an expropriated labor force. Here, the specific histories no longer float in history, like so many atoms in the void at the mercy of an encounter that might not take place. Everything is accomplished in advance. The structure precedes its elements and reproduces them in order to reproduce the structure. 
And this I also turned into a communist poem. Number 201, after Louis, the aleatory nature of the encounter. The proletariat as a, big pro a product of big industry, a product of capitalist exploitation, confusing the production of the proletariat with its capitalist reproduction on an extended scale, an expropriated labor force, the void, an encounter. <laughs> Althusser invites us to theoretically reconsider this peculiar void, at least in relation to the encounter between owners of labor power and owners of money, which Marx so clearly established. <clears throat> it is a void, perhaps, where capital, which is just one of the elements that are necessary for the establishment of a capitalist mode of production, is fundamentally not in control of the historical situation. Because, following Uno, we could say its power is inseparable from its encounter with labor power, which represents capital's weakness, its Achilles' heel. So it seems to me that Althusser's insistence on thinking about this void or emptiness in the encounter is uh, analogous to Uno's insistence that whenever we think about or consider the commodification of labor power, we also have to recognize that capital cannot avoid having to pass through this moody, a place in which there is an absence of reason where violent force and antagonistic struggles abound. So could the moody uh, be another name for what Althusser enigmatically called the void? Are both of them thinking about this peculiar place? Are they thinking about it precisely perhaps as the epicenter for thinking about the practices and the politics of real proletarian struggles and for thinking the meaning of class struggles, rethinking the meaning of class struggles in terms of the non-guaranteed character of these struggles. This is how I understand Althusser's notion of the conjuncture, the analysis of which signifies in his words, the attempt to think not only the contingency of necessity but also the necessity of contingency at its root. Why should we care about this unsettling pair of concepts of contingency and necessity? We should care and think about this because it is about the reality of history, but also the reality of politics, the reality of concrete struggles that have to be accounted for in the historical analysis of the present conjunction. As Althusser wrote, it is perhaps no accident that this curious pair of concepts interested above all men who sought in the concepts of encounter and conjuncture a means with which to think not only the reality of history, but above all the reality of politics, not only the essence of reality, but above all the essence of practice and the link between these two realities in their encounter in struggle. I say struggle and at the limit, war. The struggle was the struggle for recognition, but also, well before Hegel, the struggle of all against all that is known as competition, or when it takes this form, class struggle and its contradictions. And here I conclude with my final communist poem, Après Louis 188, Encounter and Conjuncture. Think the reality of history, the reality of politics, essence of reality, the essence of practice, the link between these two realities in their encounter in struggle. At the limit, war, the struggle for recognition, the struggle of all against all that is known as competition, or when it takes this form, class struggle and its contradictions. Thank you very much.